We will be um, proceeding with the next session, and um, Dr. Ol Dora, uh, Laura Olivieri will be uh, presenting, um, will be moderating the session. Uh, Dr. Olivieri is Director of Imaging at UPMC Children's Hospital, and she's Associate, of, uh, 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 Associate Professor of Pediatrics uh, here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm um, very honored to be uh, moderating this next uh, part of our session, which is really uh, a special part of the session regarding staged treatment, <clears throat> stage treatment of Epstein's anomaly. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Joan Sanchez de Toledo. He's an assistant professor of both pediatrics and critical care here in Pittsburgh at UPMC. Um, he will be uh, joining us uh, remotely to discuss the critical, manage critical care management of neonatal Epstein's anomaly. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I think uh, that you can see my presentation. Yes. And you can hear me well. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, that's not important. The important is the slides. So thank you very much for uh, the kind introductions and thank you very, very, very much to letting me participate in this symposium. It's a true privilege and I'm very, very honored uh, to be here with, with all of you. I have uh, uh, 12, 13 minutes to talk about uh, management of neonatal uh, Epstein. And I think that uh, uh, what we'll try to do over these uh, few minutes is summarize those four Five things that you see in the slide. Um, we'll talk about the, the importance of uh, risk stratification. Uh, we'll uh, talk about postnatal physiology and the impact of uh, this physiology on our management in the ICU. We'll give you some uh, tips or practical uh, guidelines uh, on, on medical management, and then we'll present the algorithm that we have uh, defined here uh, in, in Pittsburgh the last uh, uh, years of experience. Um, as, as we all know, uh, we're talking about a, uh, a difficult entity that has a, uh, a variety of uh, uh, presentations due to this uh, particular anatomy. But we all know that the neonatal presentation and the, the, the neonatal presentation usually connotes the more severe disease. Uh, and this is particularly important, and this will lead the, 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 fur, the further discussion. And we hope that the, in, during the panel discussion, we can uh, expand a little bit about those, those things. There are several uh, uh, publications, there's multiple uh, uh, multivariate uh, and multicenter studies that talk about the, 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 the factor, the risk factors prenatally. And if you analyze all those publications, they all end up talking about the same thing. Prematurity, the presence of pulmonary valve regurgitation, the presence of tricuspid valve regurgitation, and the presence of pericardial effusion or hydrops as well. So, well, those things, prematurity, anatomical uh, uh, um, valve uh, dysfunction, pericardial effusion, they talk about three important concepts that leads the physiologic rearrangements of these patients. Gestational age tells us about PVR, a difficult transition to the uh, newborn life, increase pulmonary pressures, increase a, uh, a load to the lungs, difficult uh, to ventilate, so increase PVR. The second, that both the PV and the, and the tricuspid valve regurgitation leads us to the, a, um, a, the circular, circular shunt concept. And last but not least, the presence of pericardial effusion which is the extreme form of congestive heart failure, which is in, 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 in fetus life, what we uh, can see or we can call uh, hydropic uh, babies. So we need to understand what the circular shunt is, and this is why 
uh, the previous uh, panelists and uh, the previous speakers have uh, very well described the, the physiology behind the circular shunt, conditioned by the presence of the, the PDA, the tricuspid valve, and the pulmonary valve insufficiency. And then the presence of the congestive heart, congestive heart that it's easily, it's easy to identify on an X-ray, uh, huge heart, um, huge liver on exam, and this is a common feature of all these uh, very sick neonates. And also the concept of PVR and how the PVR relates to the to the understanding of cardiopulmonary interactions, and and this is probably the one of the most important uh, things that the bedside physician needs to. Uh, take into account when he wants to manage uh, those patients. So if we put together the anatomy and the physiology, we know now that the more severe anatomic variants of Epstein involve those with severe tricuspid regurgitation, severe congestive heart failure with cardiac dilation, and obviously those with reduced or non-existent pulmonary anterograde blood flow. And we know that the progressive uh, congestive heart failure with dilation of the heart leads to what we knew on the previous slide, it's difficult cardiopulmonary inter interactions and the intervent interventricular dependence will hamper the function of the left heart, decreasing further the left cardiac output. And as well, the progressive cardiac enlargement will have a deleterious impact on pulmonary lung inflation, also contributing to increasing the PVR and increasing the uh, afterload of the right ventricle. So when we talk about pulmonary management of those patients, and excuse me if I'm very broad, but I think that those are the concepts that we have to be, take into account. Pulmonary vasodilation to promote anterograde pulmonary blood flow. And, and I don't want to go into how much oxygen, how much NO. So we need to promote pulmonary vasodilation. But also we need to treat congestive heart failure. And, and I will give you a couple of uh, important concepts to relate to that in the next couple of slides. But then an, another important uh, thing, and it's something that uh, Dr. Truco alluded to on his previous, in, in her previous presentation is, how are we going to use prostaglandins in these patients? When it's time to stop, uh, stop prostaglandins, what is the deleterious effect that prostaglandins will have in a patient that needs prostaglandins? When to stop it? When to slow it down? And then two, two important things. What about pressure, positive, positive pressure ventilation? What about volume, right? So at the end is pulmonary vasodilation, con congestive heart failure, and judicious and rational uh, yeah, use of prostaglandins. And I wanna mention, and I wanna focus on that slide because we all know, and we have all been told that volume saves lives. But listen, since 2005, cardiac intensities insist that volume overload is not good and that Volume of, and indeed, volume overload is associated with mortality to our patients. So in a patient with congestive heart failure, giving volume and chasing volume to numbers that we don't know exactly what they mean, such as the CVP, will end up creating problems. Pulmonary edema, pleural effusions, pericardial effusion, and that's why these patients develop a, a severe high drops in utero. And I mentioned that the, it took a while uh, to realize that what we did to save lives was indeed causing problems. So we all know now that before pushing too much volume in an ICU, you need to assess the heart. So these patients, and particularly the ones that suffer from right-sided congestive heart failure, are the ones that are more vulnerable to uh, the judicious uh, uh, a uh, volume um, uh, resuscitation. So please, please, please just take a minute before giving volume to those patients. And the same thing applies to the positive uh, 
pressure ventilation. Remember that this is a passive, almost a passive flow to the lungs. And the venous return is severely hampered by positive pressure ventilation. And we, if we all know that venous return a, uh, equation, which is the ratio between the gradient between the mean systemic feeling pressure and the right atrium pressure, the more increase or the higher increases of, of the, uh, of the uh, um, right ventricle afterload, the farther will decrease the, the, the venous return. So every single time that you put one of these patients on a positive pe uh, uh, pressure ventilation, you have to think that you will suffer from venous return, which indeed is the cardiac output of these patients. And it's important to understand what we have here in the right side of the slide, which is the relationship between PVR and volume expansion. We all want, we always want to live in the FRC zone, a patient that is severely over um, expanded will have increased PVR, but the one that has a telectasis has also increased PVR. So try to always keep your patient in the FRC zone. This is a simple way to think in a practical manner, how to manage this, those patients. Obviously a patient that is stable doesn't stay long time in the ICU. So it's not a worth uh, talking about the left side of this graph, but when a patient is unstable and you you have to start medical management in the ICU, you have to think about the, th the, the three concepts that I, I, I alluded uh, first. Do we have um, circular shunt? Do we have pulmonary vascular regurgitation? We have, do we have tricuspid valve regurgitation? Do we have functional or anatomical pulmonary atresia? And if so, then try to promote anterograde pulmonary flow and stop prostaglandins. Try to stop progressively the prostaglandins to see how the improvement of pulmonary uh, uh, flow will sustain uh, this patient cardiac output. So we all know that there's this subset of patients that are hemodynamically unstable due to the circular shine that will, that will give us a, a very, very, very hard time to manage them in the ICU. So before putting them on ECMO or before sending them to, um, to um, the operation, the, the, the theater, what we need to do is think about methods to restrict the duct ductal flow while we promote at the same time a, um, a pulmonary vasodilation. This is probably the most challenging thing, trying to combine ways to restrict a, a PDA size, but also promote pul pulmonary blood flow. Those are complex patients to manage, and this takes time, experience, and multidisciplinary a, um, work with all the, the surgical team and the cat uh, and the cardiology um, uh, group. Uh, I wanna mention uh, this because uh, as we all know, this is a, uh, a fetal problem and the circular shan appears on the more severe patients and are oftenly a, 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 a fetuses and uh, we have all read about the, 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 the challenge with in the, in the medicine in utero, but what about those patients that cannot receive in the medicine and what about the side effects of in the medicine itself? And this is a, a recent paper about the use of hyper, uh, uh, hyperoxia to promote pulmonary vasodilation in utero to uh, eventually promote a, um, a pulmonary blood flow. Uh, again, this is going back to the basics, going back to the physiology and trying to uh, combine those three things, those three concepts that I said in order to promote cardiac output to, to those patients. Therefore, uh, we know that the, the, the varying spectrum of presentations and, and, and the physiology of neonatal absence anomaly uh, demands a tailored approach to the management. 
we have to take the risk factors into, con into consideration. We have to study the anatomic features of each case and understand the derived physiology, physiology which will help individualize the postnatal care. And at the end, again, we need to focus on promoting pulmonary flow, think about avoiding mechanical ventilation as much as you can, think about early initiation of pulmonary vasodilators. We have to treat congestive heart failure. We don't need to push volume. We need to diarrhea these patients. We need to avoid fluid overload. And we need to use judiciously vasoactive and inotropic support. Which ones? I don't know. Whatever center protocol has, but we need to promote left heart function and we need to promote venous return. Choose whatever you want, but keep things simple. Thinking too much and overreacting will end up over treating patients that otherwise will probably be okay on the floor. So thank you very much. And I look forward to discussing further this uh, topic in the panel discussion.